The destruction of the Amazon rainforest is one of the great tragedies of our time. The Earth's green lungs torn out to make way for short-term farming and cattle ranching. This may mean disaster for the wildlife of lowland rainforests, but there is one place where cattle farming has become essential for the continued survival of one of the world's rarest birds. These are the Paramo Highlands of Ecuador, a vast rolling grassland suspended between three and five thousand meters above sea level in the thin cold air of the Andes. One of the largest birds in the world, the Andean condor, patrols these windswept heights. The condor's shadow first swept across these mountains over a million years ago. For thousands of years, they fed on the huge remains of mastodons and giant sloths. Now it is man who is the chief provider of carrion for these huge birds. Over 500 years ago, the condors witnessed the rise of the Inca Empire, which reached from Ecuador to Argentina and subdued more than a hundred different native peoples. The Incas worshipped the sun god, Inti. But both local Indians and Incas believed the condor was a messenger from the gods of the mountains. The Incas lived not only in the fertile valleys, but also on the high paramo. Agriculture was impossible here. Instead, they farmed herds of domesticated llamas, bred from their wild relative, the guanaco. Vicunas are also adapted to the harsh conditions of the high Andes. Their lower incisors grow continuously. This enables them to feed on the hard grasses, which rapidly grind down the teeth of other grazing animals. Instead of farming llamas, as the Incas had done, the Spanish conquistadors brought new animals to the Andes, such as cattle. During this time of oppression, the condor became a symbol of freedom for the Indians. In a gruesome ceremony, which is still performed in remote parts of the Andes, the bird's feet were sewn to the back of a bull. If it managed to release its bonds, this was seen as a sign that the Indians, too, would be freed from Spanish domination. Indian shepherds still make flutes out of condor feathers or wing bones, playing a haunting music which the condors must hear as they soar overhead. The Antisana Hacienda is the highest in the country, and it is still farmed in the traditional way. There's no doubt that conditions are harsh for the herds on the high Paramo, but every death is the lifeblood of Antisana's wildlife. As the morning sun drives away the frost, caracaras arrive to feed on the carcass of a dead sheep. They nest in a ravine alongside the Andean hill star hummingbird. It's extraordinary to find hummingbirds breeding at such an altitude. At over 4,000 meters, the chicks could die of cold. The female has managed to line her nest with a thick layer of wool, even though she can't pull the wool from a carcass herself. But the female caracara is able to pull wool from dead sheep for her nest. The hummingbird hovers directly below the caracara nest, in full view of the sitting tenant, teasing out skeins of wool and taking them to line her own nest. The caracara seems to be unconcerned about this daylight robbery, which is remarkable, for hummingbirds are on the caracara's menu.
In order to conserve energy, the hummingbird's temperature falls at night. This is when marsupial frogs emerge to breed in sheltered pools under cover of darkness. They have evolved a remarkable way of protecting their eggs. In order to release the tadpoles, the female has to go through what appears to be a rather uncomfortable experience. She uses her hind feet to stretch open the pouch on her back, where her fertilized eggs have been developing into tadpoles for the last two months. She releases all the tadpoles, scraping out every corner of the pouch with her hind feet. Though the eggs are given a head start by lying within the safety of the pouch, the tadpoles will now be vulnerable to predation as they grow over the next two months. By dawn, a feral horse has succumbed to the cold and there's another corpse on the high paramo. The first outrider of death is already there. An Andean fox won't have the corpse to itself for long. It hastily gorges on the parts which are the first to thaw, usually the intestines. These foxes have not benefited from the presence of man. Their natural prey, rabbits and other small mammals, have gradually decreased in numbers due to overhunting and the burning of the paramo. The greatest threat to the wild foxes is rabies. Fox numbers are falling steadily as they become infected by stray dogs from the hacienda. As the sun strengthens, the fox retreats to leave the carcass to daytime scavengers, such as caracaras. Though caracaras do catch small birds, they have a great appetite for carrion. The fox has already opened up the carcass, so the bird is able to feed immediately. All too soon, it's deprived of sole ownership of the spoils. It's thought that arriving on foot, rather than alighting next to a feeding bird, reduces aggression towards the newcomer. Soon the carcass is surrounded by brightly coloured adult caracaras and brown juveniles. The adults are under pressure to provide a constant stream of fledglings and insects now that both eggs have hatched. As soon as the female arrives, she begins to feed the older chick. The younger tries to intercept some morsel before it reaches the gaping beak of its older sibling, 
but each time the food unerringly finds its way into the ever-expanding crop of the older bird. It's only when the older chick is no longer hungry that the younger finally gets its share. During this period of mild weather, the calls of begging chicks are suddenly drowned by the sounds of people and thundering hooves on the paramo. <laughs> For the vaqueros of the Antisana Hacienda, the biggest event of the year is the roundup. Their feral cattle roam free over 90,000 hectares of grassland and are almost wild. It will take all the manpower the Hacienda can muster to organize this real rodeo. Each rider will use about three horses during the day, so 60 horsemen will need to catch over 200 horses for just one day of cattle driving. If it is to succeed, the rodeo will have to be meticulously coordinated. <laughs> The horsemen divide into small groups and then try to drive the scattered cattle towards an earth-banked corral. The distances to be covered are so vast that communication between the horsemen is almost impossible. In order to indicate their positions on the paramo to the rest of the vaqueros, the men light fires in the tinder dry grass. As the rodeo progresses, each group moves on and lights a new marker, leaving the previous fires unattended. After several hours, the vaqueros are closing in on the corral. The cattle are unwilling to make their task any easier. Each bull must be lassoed, and even within this small arena, great skill is needed. After they've been lassoed, the long line is slowly winched in towards the branding post. It can take up to four men to hold one bull. By now, the fires which were lit earlier are spreading rapidly over the grasslands. This is partly intentional, as the hacienda believes that burning encourages new grass shoots. This may benefit domestic stock, but almost all wildlife is now restricted to the few remaining pockets of scrub and woodland. It's thought that trees may once have extended much higher up the Paramo, but centuries of burning have reduced the numbers of plant species which grow here. Hummingbirds are especially vulnerable, for though grasses recover, their flowering food plants perish after fire. These plants are the feeding haunts of the long-tailed train bearer, which would otherwise never stay at these altitudes. The main source of food for many hummingbirds is the chukiraga flower.
the female shining sunbeam hummingbird has built a nest out of fibers and cobwebs. She incubates the eggs and rears the young without any help from the male. Hummingbird chicks remain almost naked until their pin feathers burst. The female broods them at frequent intervals when they're young, but by the time they're ten days old, she leaves them exposed at night. It's not only the tiny hummingbirds that are at risk. On the open paramo, larger birds are also under threat. Friedemann Kirster has worked in Ecuador as a scientist and cameraman for many years. For some time, he has heard worrying reports about falling numbers of condors on the high paramo. Now he intends to try to film these shy birds and find out if the situation is as bad as feared. Condors are so observant that it isn't possible to erect just an ordinary hide. Instead, Friedemann had to dig a pit from which to film. Every clump of grass had to be replaced or the condors would have been suspicious. Condors live as long as people, so it's not surprising that they get to know every detail of their terrain. They won't return to a spot they feel unsure about for a long time. Friedemann had to wait for several weeks in his freezing earth cell before the condors were convinced that it was safe to come down. Caracaras are unable to defend a carcass from condors. Soon the caracaras retreat to the sidelines. A caracara is as large as a buzzard, and yet it's dwarfed beside the condor. As more condors arrive, they too adopt the same strategy as the caracaras to reduce aggression by landing a short distance away and approaching the carcass on foot. They also find it difficult to land at a precise spot if wind conditions aren't right. Feeding among condors is a remarkably calm affair on the whole. There's a well-established hierarchy once they're on the ground. After spending so much time on the Paramo, Friedemann became convinced that previous estimates of condor numbers in Antisana were optimistic. He came to the horrific conclusion that their numbers had fallen to less than 20 birds. If the population is this low in Antisana, an area which is favorable to condors, then their future throughout the rest of Ecuador and even the rest of the Andes may be in doubt. Like most scavengers, condors are remarkably clean birds and always try to wipe the gore from their heads and necks after feeding. A condor is quite capable of eating up to three kilos of meat over a third of its own body weight at one sitting. Mm -hmm. 
they can gorge so much, they're unable to take off. They depend on rising air currents to carry them aloft. This is one reason why condors are so vulnerable on the rocky cliff faces where they roost. They're sometimes trapped until the morning sun has warmed the air and created updrafts. A hundred years ago, when Edward Wimper and other Europeans first scaled these high peaks, roosts such as these became death traps for the birds. The condors were mainly killed for sport. Though the condor is now a protected species, this has not saved it from persecution. This female has had one foot shot off. Cattle farmers have always believed that condors kill newborn calves and foals. Even today, ranchers still persist in shooting or poisoning condors. Friedemann's reports of the low condor population in Antisana persuaded the Ecuadorian conservation authorities to take action. Friedemann soon found his home and garden declared an official condor rescue station. These two immature birds are lucky to be alive. One has lived in a small dark cage in a hotel since birth. The other is only one year old. He was shot out of the sky by a hunting Indian, who then kept him tied to a post near his hut, covered in shotgun wounds. He will probably never fly again. The reasons for persecution may lie deeper than merely the threat the birds pose to livestock. To the Spanish conquistadors, the condor was a symbol of Indian paganism they attempted to eradicate. If the condor is to survive, the remaining myths surrounding these huge birds must be dispelled. The message is gradually sinking in. This flute maker recently tried to get hold of two condors to make more instruments, but failed to do so because, as he complained, there aren't any condors left on my paramo. This is a harsh place to live. The steepest hillsides are exposed to the icy winds which sweep down from Antisana, scraping off the top layer of vegetation and suffocating man and beast with volcanic ash. Yet this rugged, hazardous way of life is the last hope for the condor of Ecuador. If these last haciendas vanish, then so too will the condor.